Welcome back to another edition of the Friday Show brought to you by Monmouth Park. Hey, they're changing post times on the Friday night card starting this week for the next two weeks. It's going to be 3 o'clock in the afternoon. In the final three weeks of the meeting in September, 12-15 post time on Friday, same as the weekends. Don't forget about the win early pick five. That's the earliest pick five in the country. I'm Ray Pollack, joined today by news editor Chelsea Hackbarth and a special guest from north of the border, Mr. Will Wong. Hey, Ray, Chelsea. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. He's an entertainment and fashion celebrity blogger in Toronto and one of the biggest racing fans that I have come across in my life. And I'm certainly the biggest racing fan in Ontario. Welcome to the Friday Show, Will. Thank you. I'll take it all. I love it. Thank you for the uh, wonderful intro. So, you know, we've we've run into each other a bunch of times at uh, at Woodbine for the Queen's Plate. I haven't been able to come up the last two years, but I was just so happy to hear the crowd uh, on the on the, the telecast of the Queen's Plate races that last Sunday. What was it like to be back there with a big crowd of people? Oh my goodness. If I compare it to last year where no, no spectators other than owners were allowed in, I mean, it was just an eerie silence. You, you could hear, you know, some cheers last year and it was just like an overcast day. And then this year, you know, the, the crowd was back, even at 50% capacity, which is wonderful hearing, cheering again in the grandstand. And it's just uh, a comforting sound uh, and feeling that energy. Um, yeah. I mean, other than like normally at Queen's Plate, part of it is, you know, the festivities, they have fashion contests, They'll have a concert, you know, they'll have a big country star come in and do a show. None of that this year, obviously, you know, just to avoid crowds. There weren't any activations, food trucks, festive stuff of that sort. But still, you you, you, ha you held that energy. As soon as I saw the crowd in the grandstand, I felt, okay, this is the Queen's Plate I know and love. And uh, it was just a joy seeing that race um, and just seeing people in the grandstand once again. Yeah. So you, you've also been involved in something else, and that's really why we have having you on this week, and that's to talk about uh, a certain horse, Conquest Daddio, that was part of Conquest Stables for uh, a couple of years, and then when they dispersed in 2016, Conquest Daddio, uh, like a lot of other horses, sort of kept going down the uh, the ladder. He he went to a sale. And then he ended up in claiming races, he ended up in lower level claiming races, uh, eventually winding up pretty much at the bottom in the uh, in the northwest in Montana and I think up in Canada as well. Um, I've got Chelsea on here because she's a horse person. I'm not a horse person. Uh, I have opinions on some of these things and whether or not horses should go down from a graded stakes winner down to the lowest claiming level. But but well, could you kind of summarize this this? multi-year effort to retire this horse and it was spurred on in part by um, Mark Cassie's groom at the time Sarah right. Volpe um, who who took care of Conquest Adio. Absolutely I mean it's been a, it's been quite a ride it took four years to uh, acquire the horse back and I know how much that horse meant to Sarah I, you know back when we us media were allowed to go visit the backstretch you know pre pre-COVID I remember just a few years uh, prior visiting him on the back stretch, just how much love she had for this horse. I mean, uh, just you, you, you see that special connection with many grooms and their horses. But you know, I thought there was something special there, how much love she had for her horses, but this one in particular. And the fact that he went on to accomplish so much success. He won the summer stakes at Woodbine. That's one of our marquee races. I mean, that race has since been upgraded to a winning you're in, and it's a grade one race now. So that just puts it into context how much potential he had. And even in the big race itself, he came fourth. He was so close to winning. Uh, the Breeders' Cup that year, and just um, you know, to see his highs and lows, like I know what that horse meant to her, just, you know, her, you know, when he was racing there, you know, asking me to send her pictures while he was there, just what he meant to her. So just seeing him, you know, achieve his pinnacle of success in his career, and just sort of like after that conquest dispersal uh, at Keeneland uh, the following fall, just, uh, you know, how much it broke her heart. I know, you know, seeing him, you know, go on to the van, what it meant to her to say goodbye, and how much that affected her. She didn't know if she'd ever see that horse again, what would become of him. And, you know, um, there were many efforts to acquire him back. I know, uh, you know, he was acquired by Connections out at Santa Anita. He was running for, he was claimed for a $20,000 tag. And he just, I think he ran a series of races over a year, just lost by like a, a combined 120 lengths. So it just, he was not competitive. And they tried figuring it out. You know, we're following along on Facebook with uh, his Connections. You know, they thought maybe he needed to be gelded. He had some type of a testicular issue that was causing a discomfort for him. So after, you know, they gelded him, they thought maybe 
things which nothing changed and finally he wound up in the fair circuit in idaho and he was training there so a lot of fans weren't sure like they you know we'd see his name pop up on uh, equibase you know we see the the train reports come through and what's he doing in idaho like what could a former breeders cup horse possibly be doing there so we did a you know a bit of investigating we asked some questions and you know the family that owned them at that time they they you know they had they, they, they were based in there and they they were just uh, he was you know keeping fit there so basically that was the reason they, at that point they had no intention of running him on the fair circuit but lo and behold he wound up on the fair circuit and then he got claimed and then at that point, you know, the, the the claiming tag for him was, you know, it was an attainable price point. So, you know, we 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 tried tried doing some crowdsourcing. We did a GoFundMe, raised some money, you know, with the generosity of the public, we were able to come up with just enough money to claim it. But then we encountered more problems because uh, there was so much social media chatter mm -hmm. that everyone knew about it. And then he was set to run up in Canada again, up north in Alberta. And then the jockey club there had found out uh, that, you know, but all the social media chat, uh, chatter and that he would been, you know, claimed to be retired and that's against their rules. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they contacted the owner at that time, made them withdraw. We'd also been in contact with the owner who promised to sell them to us and nothing really came of it. So finally this chance came up after, you know, the pandemic hit, we never were never sure if he was ever going to surface again and we'd have a chance to claim him. But fortunately he came up again for a tag uh, back in July and, uh, it was exactly, I think, three or four years after um, his first win. Uh, if you believe in astrology, I don't know, but you know that's just a little bit too uh, uncanny to be, you know, not coincidental. But we were able to get some help of a, a local trainer there and uh, claim and, and get him back for once and for all. And uh, it's, you know, it's just reassuring to know that there are happy endings out there. And I'm just happy to see Sarah, you know, get her horse back. How did you and Sarah get hooked up, Will? Uh, so I, you know, I love Woodbine. I love Cassie horses. I love, I love all, you know, I love all animals, but basically, I, they, you know, Cassie horses, they're, they, they found such an amazing level of success at Woodbine, so it's impossible not to be a fan. So, uh, you know, I, I would occasionally visit the backstretch, uh, you know, take some photos, you know, share them on social media. That's what I do, right? I love, you know, sharing the joy of what I love about the sport with the world, and that includes, you know, taking photographs, sharing the joy on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. So, um, you know, I think that's how I sort of developed my reputation, just being, you know, a good ambassador for the sport. And it's something I truly love. And I've loved since I was a kid. I've been going to Woodbine since I was three years old. So wow. any normal kid had a, you know, a normal weekend where they're playing on the, you know, or going, taking lessons on the weekend. My weekends as a kid always involved visiting the track with my parents. So, you know, I've been following the sport for quite a number of years. And um, mm -hmm. I think that's just how, you know, when after I developed my own blog about 10 years ago, I developed a bit of a following and, you know, I thought, what can I do to promote this sport better? So that's when I partnered with Woodbine, you know, found ways to, you know, cross promote uh, the sport on, you know, my social media channels, my website. So I developed a bit of a, you know, a reputation of, you know, so basically as a, you know, as a trusted name in the community. So, you know, that's enabled me privileges like backs, you know, by, uh, like, uh, you know, access to the backstretch. So, um, so, you know, occasionally I'd visit and then, you know, that gave me an opportunity to get to know the grooms and you know, the horses a bit better. So that's how I, you know, me and uh, Sarah struck a connection. Sure. So, and how did you get involved with this particular endeavor? Well, yeah, so this wasn't my first one. Like, I, I know a few years back we had a horse, you know, who he, he placed in the Queen's Plate and then he also, um, it was not on the fair circuit, but, you know, I, I used my... I was able to utilize my, my channels and my audience to spread the word about uh, awareness to raise money. So this is my second, you know, time having some experience dabbling in, you know, raising money uh, for the welfare of horses. Uh, so, you know, um, I know me and Sarah, we had been in touch quite uh, quite often through social media. And I, I know I was aware, just keeping track of his horse. I had him on my, my virtual stable uh and just yeah the the conversation came up you know what's going on with this horse why is he why is he in idaho all of a sudden so you know we had that conversation and you know maybe there's something i could have done to help her i mean i might not have the resources monetarily but you know i do have an audience uh i do have a voice and i can use my resources and i thought i'd use that to help her out so so chelsea has worked on the racetrack and she's <laughs> she's got a former racehorse that she's training to uh to do great things. Um, That's amazing. That might be an exaggeration, right? <laughs> well, good things. How about that? So one of the things that I noticed in reading your, your blog about this, about this whole, this whole saga, I mean, multi years to do this is that there's a re real resistance um, in some quarters 
to you know the concept that a horse that was a grade two stakes winners can't be racing at the bottom level of claiming and you know they they kind of overlook the fact that there are people who care you know who who, who really get attached to these horses uh, not that the people that, that have them at the bottom level don't get attached to them or don't care about them but there's a real you know there's a there's a real uh, point of conflict i think between mm -hmm some of the old guard, some of the, you know, old school people in racing, and then people that, um, you know, believe that, you know, every horse should have an after, you know, a, a, a second career when they're done racing. Okay. And I'm just kind of curious, both of you really, what your thoughts are on on that conflict between the, you know, the, the two groups uh, that, you know, kind of came to, to a point here. For sure, like I, yeah. yeah. No, well, yeah, I, I can speak first. Absolutely. Like, uh, and I think it's just finding that medium. E each school of thought, you know, the old school and the new school, they can each take something from each other to understand each other to come to a median. I think, you know, um, yeah, like what you're saying, it's, you know, there, there, there's an unsaid rule, like a, a horse that's performing at the top level, they, they shouldn't be, you know, competing at the bottom, uh, at the bottom ranks. And there's a misconception. I mean, I can clarify one thing about our efforts to, to rescue Conquest Adio. You know, we, we hope we don't have, we're not giving off the impression that we feel like, you know, just because these horses are in the fair circuit, they're, they're mistreated. It never was about that. Our intentions were always to acquire back the horse because, you know, Sarah cared so much for that horse and would have been, you know, a wonderful, you know, uh, would have given him a wonderful home. And I think, yeah, it's, it's important to clear up that misconception. You know, horses competing on the fair track, sometimes they are well taken care of and they are loved. And uh, we hope we didn't, you know, give that impression off that we, you know, we see them in that light because uh, in the end, when Mr. When Conquest Daddy O came back, you know, I mean, he was a bit leaner than he than you know than what we had last seen him. But I mean, he was in good shape. He was uh, relatively well maintained. A bit leaner, yes, but uh, we do appreciate the fact that you know he was you know given care uh, prior to us acquiring him back. Um, you know, I I gotta be honest with you both. Um, I don't understand the whole he can't possibly run for a claiming tag if if he if he ran in a graded stakes race mentality i i think that there are horses out there that love to compete and love to be at the racetrack and they it's what they've done for the from the beginning of their careers it's all they know they're unhappy when you turn them out and they want to be competitive and it, you know if, if you keep breaking their heart running them over their head then they're not enjoying themselves and then you so you drop them down where they can be competitive and they're still enjoying their career and there's no way as a as an outside fan necessarily that that you can see that yourself um that, that you can see whether or not a horse is enjoying his job now if he's finishing up the track you know over and over and over again i suppose there's an argument to be made but again i mean if he's happy like my horse for example he ran 36 times mostly at Delta Downs and a couple times at Belterra Park. Right. Um, he won once, so he wasn't much of a racehorse. <laughs> um, but you know, he he loved being on the track. It was, it's he he just enjoyed every moment. He liked to watch the goings on, and and when he retired from racing, he stayed on as a as a lead pony, and that's how I got to know him, and that's how more or less he ended up with me. So I just I think that I don't know how to fix it. I don't know how to say, hey, you know, just because he's running at the bottom doesn't mean he's not happy. Right. Um, I guess you say it just like that, though. <laughs> Maybe I don't right. know. So, what uh, what does Sarah have in, in store for uh, for Conquest Adio? Well, I did check in on him last night uh, uh -huh. just through a message, and he he's happy. He's got his two his two uh, buddies, uh, Ollie and Seven. They're also uh, one was a former uh, racehorse, and then uh, the other was just he was bred to be a pet. So he's having fun. I mean, obviously he's having a bit more fun racing with the horse that was a former racehorse because he can keep up with them, whereas the other horse just can't keep up, and he lets them go do their thing. Mm -hmm. But he's happy. The goal right now is just wellness, getting him to you know put on a bit of weight, and that's gonna happen gradually with time. I you know. What, we looked at his back. I think uh, it's gonna, is it called the Hunter's Arch or something on the back where basically Hunter's bump, yeah. Hunter's bump. So he's got that going on, and with a bit more nutrition, we can get him there. Uh, just put on put on a bit of weight. Probably by the fall, you know, we should see some results. So just getting to put on a bit of weight and just keeping him happy. He's 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 living the life. And if you want photos, I've got the proof. <laughs> 
So, well, do, do you do you ride horses at all, Will? Or are oh you, my are you... gosh, no, hell no! I'm like, yeah, I'm terrified of it actually, and I, I get asked this question almost by everyone uh, yeah, I meet who ask me, asking me about my relationship with horses. I'm happy just petting them, giving them carrots and mints, and my love for them goes that close. I mean, I'm happy to touch them, but climbing on, no, I would break their back. Literally, I mean, not to self-deprecate, but I would break their back. So, no. <laughs> Well, my riding career ended quite a long time ago. So, oh, tell us. I was, I was, uh, no, when I was, a, when I was a kid growing up in a farm, it was probably the last time I was on a horse for any serious competition. Oh, come on, Ray. Um, I've got, I've got a client that's 70 years old that I teach riding lessons to every Sunday morning. Wow. Well, when I get to be 70, maybe I'll, I'll take you up on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be watching. Yeah. Doing I'll hold you to that. I've got a long way to go. So I guess, you know, back to the issue of the philosophical differences here. Um, what, what can the industry do better, do you think, Will, to, to you know, to, not that, you know, this horse didn't necessarily slip into an unsafe place, but a lot of horses do. And uh, it's uh, in, due part, in, in large part because of the resistance from the people who have the horses at the bottom. So what, what can we do differently, do you think? Exactly. Like, and I think that's a fantastic question. It's one, unfortunately, like Chelsea, I don't have the answers. I don't know. But what I do see the problem as being a lot of it's monetary. And if we are, you know, starting from the start, we're, there's some type of a reformation where, you know, we're, we're making it mandatory to allocate even some small portions of earnings towards like a mandatory or like a retirement fund for the horse. And I think that needs to be mandated north and south of the border because horses, you know, they find their way across the border. You know, if we have some way of mandating that, some type of a, a fund that 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 makes it mandatory, I think that would be part of the problem solved because a lot of it's fine. Like for us, a big part of the challenge was gathering the money. And without getting the money, there's no way we could have acquired that horse back. So if we have things like that in place, I think that's a good start. Well, and, and of course, getting the horse back is just the start of what it costs uh, because there's, uh, as, as any horse owner can tell you, um, there's a lot of expenses involved along the way. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there is a misconception. I mean, like, you know, retiring a racehorse costs a lot. I mean, it does cost a lot of money, but nowhere as much as it would be to keep a horse in training, stabling it, and, you know, keeping up with the vet fees. But I mean, yeah, absolutely. It is an expensive um, uh, endeavor for sure. Well, at any rate, this is a story with a happy ending. Uh, we thank you and Sarah for, for looking out for this horse's best interest. And it was how many years to the it was four years from the four time years. we started trying. Absolutely. Yeah. Four years, yeah. That is some perseverance. Thank you. It's all Sarah. Sarah definitely, you know, I mean, she never gave up on him, and I was just there to help. But, you know, I know he's in good hands. He's going to be living out his days very happily. So, yeah. Well, that's great news. Well, thank you so much for what you did. In this case, thanks for joining us. Uh, I look forward to seeing you uh, next year's Queen's Plate, I hope. Absolutely. If not at Saratoga, maybe let's make a date for the Shake Shack or Hattie's for some fried chicken. How about I'm that? West. I'm, West you're right in. I'm out in Del Mar. You're going to have to fly west. Oh, uh, I'd love to make it this fall, too. It's just, yeah, the, the COVID numbers are still a bit scary here. I was thinking about it, but yeah, we're definitely not where we need to be here up here, up here in Canada yet. So next year, we'll make a date. All right. Well, we're going to be right back after we take a look at this week's Woodbine Star of the Week. And you have, you, you, you couldn't possibly guess who this is. One in front, take a chance, and safe conduct. Three furlongs to run in the Queen's Plate. Take a chance, holding on in second, safe conduct. A length away, Hadassah, coming with a run is keep grinding. And here comes safe conduct to go to the front. Keep grinding, issues the threat. Around the outside goes Tidal Forces, and trying to get a run is Hadassah on the inside. Money for Rose finishing on. Safe conduct at the top of the stretch, joined by Keep Grinding, Hadassah down in the center, running on his Avo man. It's now Keep Grinding coming, Safe Conduct, Keep Grinding, HC Holiday down the outside as well with Money for Rovic, Safe Conduct in front and here's Riptide Rock, Riptide Rock flying down the outside. I think Safe Conduct narrowly from Riptide Rock and a photo in the Queen's Plate. Back in third is HC Holiday, behind them was Keep Grinding, Money for Row, Avo man, Hadassah, and it's a photo for the win. Wow. 
That was some finish. <laughs> the whole way down the stretch, like I did, right? Just come on, come on, come on. <laughs> well, that was a, that was a first stakes win for Safe Conduct in the Queen's Play. That's a good, good first stakes win for any horse. Trained by Phil Serpy, came up from New York, went back to New York. We don't know right now if this son of Bodie Meister will go in the second leg of the Canadian Triple Crown on September 14 or not in the uh, Prince of Wales Stakes at Fort Erie. What do you think? Should he go? He's he's run on dirt a couple times. I mean, why wouldn't you go? Is that at this point, if the horse is doing well, if the travel restrictions are not restrictive, then why wouldn't you? That's right. I mean, who would skip the second leg of a triple crown after winning the first leg? doesn't happen very often. Uh, what about that second place horse? Whew, got unlucky, didn't he? Huh? Wow. Got unlucky, didn't we? Well, it didn't look, even, even in the final yards, that it could be as close as a photo finish showed it to be. No, I love finishes like that. I mean, well, don't we all? Unless I guess your money's on the on the other horse. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, I really don't think the winner actually saw the second place horse no, until he was so far right there the before the wire. Yeah. I think the winner was so game. Had he even seen the other horse coming, he would have re-rallied again. So got a good you shot know, in the triple crown races. You know what I noticed in watching that race, uh, the full race, is that when the horses broke from the gate and they raced past the finish line the first time, the crowd was cheering like the race was <laughs> over. <laughs> and when we were talking to, to Mr. Will Wong earlier off camera, uh, he said, you can always tell when there's when there's a lot of uh, new fans at the track. They do that They do that as the horses run by the first time. It's always fun. <laughs> Oh, um, please well, Phil Serpy, come on, run this horse in the second leg of the Triple Crown. You know, it's it's uh, you're going for history here. Um, that's going to do it for this week's edition of the Friday Show. Thanks to Monmouth Park for their sponsorship. Thanks to Woodbine. Uh, we really appreciate having Mr. Will Wong on there. You can check him out uh, on his blog. We'll we'll link to that and all the social media. He does a great job promoting horse racing, among the other things he does. Chelsea, we'll see you again. Thanks for joining us. Uh, until next time, bye-bye.